So today I want to make a video that I've been meaning to make for a little while and that's on OVN and it'll probably be a bit of a series on OVN so we'll start by looking at how um, OpenStack and Neutron work with OVN and then we'll also take a look at how OpenShift is using OVN Kubernetes and how some of those constructs are the same and you can take your knowledge that you've learned from OpenStack and also apply that in OpenShift with OVN Kubernetes. So there's a fair bit of stuff that needs to be covered when we talk about um, OVN. So you first need to understand from the Neutron perspective how we use the plugin based system with ML2 to then use different providers for that network configuration. If you're used to Red Hat OpenStack Platform 13, um, 16.1 with NFE workloads, then you'll be familiar with ML2 OVS. And that basically used the Open vSwitch driver to create open flow rules. And that was really good from a layer two perspective. Open vSwitch is really good at doing layer two things. But when it comes to doing some of the more complex things, um, it really kind of fell apart. And that's where we relied on uh, queue routers and network namespaces for DHCP and routing. Um, when it comes to DVR, it was a really like hodgepodge kind of solution where we used those those routers and it wasn't always the best system because we had to update open flow rules as well as queue routers and the queue routers needed to be aware of the MAC address tables from all nodes. So it wasn't really a holistic solution that really worked very well for the DVI use case. And there was a bunch of other limitations with ML2 OVS as well. So ML2 OVN is really designed to address some of those scaling and limitations that the other previous drivers have had. And we can do things like DVR now with a lot more consistency because of the way it's structured. And we're going to look at that in this video today and try and understand how OVN works and how the solution comes together to form a better SDN product. And then we can take that knowledge and apply it to OpenShift in an upcoming video. So one of the common things we need to do is if it doesn't work, we need to figure out why it's not working. So the other thing I'm going to show in this video is how to go through and trace packets. So if you are trying to ping an instance and that traffic isn't working, we can use OVN trace and OF proto trace from Open vSwitch to work out where that drop is actually happening. And then we can start to troubleshoot from there. So in the video, I will be going over some of the things in this blog post. So this is a blog post made by a friend of mine, also a fellow Red Hatter. So here he has all the steps that we need to figure out how to use the OVN trace. And there's a bunch of cool things here we can do with TCP dump um, and take the, the hex from the TCP dump and actually put that into OVN trace and see how that, that flow works out. So we will look at that as well. So to start with, Let's take a look here. So we're on our director node. So the first thing we want to do is we want to log into our controller node. So I've already got a tab for that here. So on our controller node, if we do PCS status, so if you're using OSP 16, or even if you're using OSP 13, but you're using OVN, you will have this OVN DBS bundle running in Pacemaker. Now, in upcoming releases, we're going to try and replace this with Raft, so it won't be an OVN-managed uh, container anymore. It will be completely managed on the OVN side by OVN itself using the Raft protocol. But for now, it is running in Pacemaker. So this is our, this is our databases. This is our, our northbound database. So when we store information, we store it in two databases. We store it in the northbound database, and that's basically a database full of objects. So if you create a network, that will appear as a switch. If you create a router, that's a logical router. Um, we've looked at load balances before in my courier video. If you haven't seen that, I can, I'll insert some, some screenshots here of um, looking at the load balances in OVN. And then we have the southbound database. And the southbound database is all of the flow rules. So a flow rule is how a packet is handled when it enters the system. So when that packet enters the system, it needs to match a bunch of flow rules. And we can look at the flow rules in OVS using OFCTL dump flows BRX, for example. So on our external bridge, there's just one flow rule. This is really simple. This means that when a packet comes in, don't do anything with it. We're just going to handle it. We're not going to drop it. We're not going to do any kind of special handling. We're just going to treat it as if it was coming into a switch that was configured with VLAN 1, native VLAN, and everything's plugged into it. 
So if we take a look at BRX, for example, we can see on BRX we have our bond interface, and that's it. There's nothing else that happens on our BRX on this on this particular node. But what happens if we look at BR int, for example? So there's a few extra flow rules here. Now I'm on a controller that's not actually I've specifically designed it so that this is going to be minimal flow rules. We'll look at a compute node in a minute. So you can see on this node there's not many open flow rules. Now what happens is OVN is taking the information from the southbound database in the logic flows and it's turning that into open flow rules that OpenBSwitch can then use. So once we're logged into our OVN controller, what we can do is OVN SBCTL dump flows. Now this is all the logic flows. This is where all of that, that work that I was saying can't be done by OVS is happening. You see here there's a lot more logic, right? We have these SNAT rules. Um, we will have how to handle ARP requests, for example. We should have some DHCP entries as well. So if we go up a little bit higher, uh, maybe we just grab for DHCP. So here's all the DHCP rules, for example. You can see that when I have virtual machines created, there needs to be a DHCP entry. So OVN is actually responsible for responding to that DHCP request when that comes in. So you can see here, for example, when it comes in this port, which we'll have a look at in a second, and it has this MAC address, and it is sending it to this IPv4 source, which it, which it will be, it'll be a broadcast packet. So if we're coming from no IP address and we're sending it to the broadcast domain on 68 or 67, then the action will be to offer the, the DHCP information to that system. So what we're offering it is this 192.168.50.94 and that will have these routes so the default route will be via 192.168.50.1 which is our router in this case and it's going to give it my D DNS server. So this information is provided to OVN by Neutron. So before we get too into the weeds here let's go have a look at these networks. So back on our director node we're going to export OS cloud equals over cloud. We're going to do OpenStack network list. So here we'll see that we have two networks. We have, oh, well, we have three. We can delete this one though. Stack. So we have our infranet and our testnet. Now testnet is my internal network. It's just a tenant network. It's only local to the OpenStack environment. And then the infrastructure network is the network that is my provider network. It's the one that's all attached to everything. It gets DHCP addresses from my router, etc., etc. So if we do OpenStack subnet list, we'll see the two subnets for them. And we can see here that we're using 192.168.50 for the tenant network, and that's the DHCP address that we just saw in OVN. And for the provider network, we're using 172.20.00 slash 16. So this will be, if I create floating IPs, for example, they will be on this network. If I attach a VM directly to the infrastructure network, it will pick up an IP address here and be able to communicate on the same layer 2 domain as everything else in my network. If I attach them here, then they will only be able to NAT, so I won't be able to ping that, that server directly. So what we need then is a router. So we can OpenStack router list and we'll see that I have a router here. Now if we do OpenStack a router show on this router, we will see that it has both of these subnets attached and it uses the infrastructure subnet as the gateway subnet. So that's this one here. And it has an external IP address, which is on my infrastructure network of 172.20.16.22. For the tenant network, it has an IP address of 192.168.50.1. And if you remember back here, that's the gateway that we're handing out in our DHCP offer. So my VM will need to speak with that router first and that router will then speak with my, my network and nap that traffic. So we can see that in OVN as well. If we do, we'll just bring it up a bit. So we do OVN NBCTL show. So we can see here, 
we have these two networks that are created. So this is the test network at the top and the infrastructure network down the bottom. Now they appear as logical switches within OVM. So when we create any VMs that are attached to them, they get ports that are plugged into these switches. Think of it just as a normal physical switch and we're physically plugging in our, our virtual machine when we create it. So we see here, for example, that this is our virtual machine and we can see that there's a port there. So we go back to what we were looking at before, grep the HTTP and we will grep for that. We can see that these flow rules match that specific port. So that's where that port in port ID comes from. So if we go, oh, the other thing we can look at is how that traffic is natted. So we can do OVN NBCTL find NAT. So this finds NAT rules within the system. So we can see there, for example, that traffic coming from 192.168.50.0 slash 24 needs to be NATed out this IP address. And that's the IP address of that router that we just looked at within Neutron. When we look down here, for example, we can see that what we have is a floating IP. So this floating IP has an external MAC address. It has a floating IP ID, and it has the router that the floating IP is hosted on. The external IP address, 172.20.16.20. So what happens when we add a floating IP address is that that router actually takes that port and start speaking on behalf of our virtual machine. It's like a one-to-one -one NAT, and you can see here that we're doing DNAT and SNAT, so destination NAT and source NAT, all from this single IP address. That's how floating IP works. Whereas up here, we were just doing SNAT, so just source NAT. So when the VM talks, everything is source NATed from 172.20.16.22. Whereas here, I can directly reach this, this IP address and I can log into it, ping it, and it can also ping me and the traffic will appear to come from that IP address. And we can see that if we go here, I'll zoom in a bit. So if I ping that IP address, we can see I'm able to ping it. If I SSH to Fedora, at that, we can see that I'm able to log in. And now I'm logged into a virtual machine running in OpenStack. And I did that all through the floating IP address in this case. So there are, there's multiple commands that we can use for NAT. So if you want to find out any commands, what I normally do is OVN NBCTL dash dash help, and then I grep for what I want. So we're going to grep dash I NAT. So here's some interesting information that we can get from the environment. So we need to specify a router in this case. So we can do OVN NBCTL show, remembering that the northbound database is showing me all of the objects that exist within the OpenStack environment. So what we can do is OVN NBCTL LR NAT list and then give it a router ID, which in this case is this one. And we can see it gives us this AKA, which is really handy because that maps to what I've called it in Neutron. I don't need to know the specific UID, for example. So that is a bit of a nicer way to see those NAT rules. So you can see there that we do the DNAT SNAT through the external IP, which is our floating IP. And in that case, we need to assign it an external MAC address as well, so that the router is able to respond to ARP requests to that MAC address. So when my router, my physical router says, who has 172.20.16.20, it's able to respond from the node that this is hosted on, from the gateway chassis, and say, hey, it is here. And then we can send traffic to it. So, that's the high level of the northbound database and I will, as I said, insert that clip of what um, load balances look like in OVN as well. But let's take a look at what the southbound database looks like when we do an OVN SPCTL show. So this gives us chassis in this case. So we can see there that we have two chassis. This is only a two node environment. I have one compute node and one controller node deployed. Now the compute node has two port bindings and that's what we might expect because the compute node is obviously hosting my virtual machines. So if we look for what this port was, OVN NBCTL show and we'll grab for that. We can see it there, so we'll just do an A5, B5 to get a bit of context. So we can see there in this case, that's the port ID of my virtual machine. So from that virtual machine, if we log back in, do an IPOA, 
can see that it has that 192.168.50.94 IP address. 192.168.50.94 and the MAC address should also match as well. So there's our MAC address. We do IPA. We can see that the MAC address is indeed the right one. So if we want to work out where the traffic is going, say this doesn't work, let's let's break it, let's stop it from working. So what we'll do is we look at our VM, server list. So there's our virtual machine. We'll do OpenStack server show on this VM. And you can see there the, the floating IP address that's assigned as well. So we can see there's no security groups here. So let's go ahead and create a security group. And we just want to block ICMP in this case. So what we're going to do is call, call it block ICMP. And then we'll do OpenStack security group rule create. I can never remember the exact argument, so we just run, run the command. It will give you all of the arguments, so we can see them all there. And now we know what we need, so we'll do OpenStack security group rule create and what we want to do is so what we want to do is just add in our ability to SSH in so we'll call it TCP and we will give it a DST port of 22 we, we still want to be able to log into it block ICMP and because we haven't explicitly given it any rules that will allow ICMP that will block by default so what we can do is OpenStack server add security group Fedora 36 VM up oh, 46 for years in the future block ICMP. Okay, so I've disabled port security on that port, so we can do open stack port list. Just... Might be easier if my head's up the top. Okay, so this is our port, so we want to do open stack port show and we'll, what we'll see here is that I've actually disabled port security on this particular port. So if we look at port security enabled we've got false. So what we're going to do is do OpenStack port set enable port security on oh. this port So we're enabling port security and then we will add in the security group again. Now my connection has dropped at this point because there was no security group associated with that so we should be dropping everything. So I show Fedora 36, I did again, VM. Okay, so now we have a security group that is block ICMP. So if we try and SSH to it, we can still get in. That's what we want. If we try and ping it, we can't ping that VM anymore. So let's take a look at how port security is being enforced when we're using OVM. So if we go to our compute node, which is here, and we do OVN, uh, OVS, VSCTL show. Here we can see a bit more interesting information. So in our BRX we have this EDH7 interface. Let's just do a quick TCP dump on this interface. And we're going to filter for ICMP traffic going to host 172.20.16.22. And okay. Ah, oh, 16.20, my bad. So here we can see that ICMP echo request is actually coming in on the external interface. 
but how did my computer know to send that traffic to this specific compute node? Let's take a quick look at that before we dive into how that's being enforced here. So back in OVM, if we do OVM and BCTL show again, and we look at our router, so this is our router here, we can see it has a gateway chassis. Now this gateway chassis is going to correspond to a node in the southbound database. So we do OVN SBCTL show. Now we're looking for the node that ends in 911. In this case, it's this one. So that's our compute node. Now what that means is it's being used as the gateway for all traffic on that router. So there's something that needs to happen for that to work. So we do OVN, NBC, OVN SBCTL list chassis. We can see here all of the chassis that appear in the environment. Now obviously if you have a massive environment, this is gonna have heaps of nodes in it. But if we look at our compute node here, we can see that it has this special option called OVN CMS options, enable chassis as gateway. Now what that means is that that node can be used as a gateway chassis. So this is a really important fact to remember if you're deploying an environment with DVR, it doesn't necessarily mean that the compute node hosting the virtual machine will be the one that sends the traffic out to the network. DVR just means that it's distributed virtual routing. It could be on any node. The traffic could come from any node and any one point of failure won't result in failure for that traffic. So your VM could be on compute node 22 but the traffic might come out compute node 16. It depends which one is enabled as the gateway chassis and it depends which chassis gets the higher priority when it comes to routing that traffic. So if we look at LRP, so if we do OVN NBCTL LRP get gateway chassis and we give it a port, so we need the port name. So we will look at So we can see there that that has a priority. Now, in a normal big environment, this is going to have a lot of nodes, and the nodes that have the higher priority are the ones that the traffic is going to be sent via first. So we can LRP add a gateway chassis. LRP set gateway chassis, yes. Right, so in this case, to make things simple, what I did was I actually deleted the two nodes and I just added that node so that I could show you guys something a bit more simple. But let's, let's add the other node back now. So we need the other chassis ID. So we scroll up to here. So this is the chassis ID of our controller. So we'll paste that in there. And the port is different. Now if we run it again, we can see that there is two. So in this case, the traffic will go via this one because it has the lower priority. But if it fails, then it will go via this one. And now you could have four or eight or any number that are in here. So that's where that external MAC address comes into play. It means that my compute node or the node acting as the gateway chassis is going to advertise that MAC address. So when I ping it, my router knows where to send that traffic. Let's go back to our compute node. We can see our ICMP requests are coming in. So where is this being blocked then? I mean, let's have a look from our, our VM's perspective. If we, we'll leave that running, we'll open a new tab and zoom in again for you guys and we will log into that node. Now let's TCP dump from here and see if we can figure out what's going on. So the virtual machine is not seeing ICMP traffic. So if the traffic is coming to the compute node and the VM is hosted on the compute node, there must be something on this compute node that's blocking this traffic. So let's try and figure that out. So first, let's start with looking at open vSwitch. Where's that traffic coming in? It's coming in here on BRX and on this specific port. 
So let's do a dump flows here and see what we can figure out. Dump flows on VRX. Yes, OF, because we're looking at open flow. So again, it's the same as our, our controller node. It's just one single rule. So everything is just plugged in and everything's going to see this traffic. So what else do we have on our bridge then? We have PRX, which is just an interface, but we also have this patch port. So interface patch provnet to BR int. So that gives us a bit of a hint about where this is going. It's a patch port, which generally in open vSwitch terms means it's going to another bridge. And we know that it has a name and a UID. So let's go and have a look in BRInt and see how we can find that patch port. I can actually already see it. It's right there. So there's our patch port. So what we need to look at now is what happens in OpenFlow on BRInt. Now this one's massive. There's a lot of rules here. So we can try and narrow it down a little bit if we do grep for the IP address. Let's try that. So that's a little bit easier. Now we have rules that fit on my screen and we can see everything that should match for, for this traffic. So if we take a look at the very first one, which is actually this one here. Let's see what's happening in this rule and now my head's blocking it again. You know what, let's just go to the screen share. No one needs to see my face. So here, what happens? We're on table 11. We definitely are getting hits because the number of packets that have hit this rule are 54. So this is an ARP rule. So this is going to match on our ARP traffic. Now it's going to match on any ARP requests coming in for 172.20.16.20. The actions are going to be move the ethernet source destination so we're not going to worry too much about all of the intricacies of open vSwitch, maybe that's a different video. But what we need to know that we're modding the data link source to FA16 3E9573 5B. So that is not this. So what's going on there then? That's not the MAC address of our virtual machine. Why would we be modifying the ARP request to go to this MAC address. Let's find out what that MAC address is. So we come back here and we do open stack port list and let's just grep for that MAC address, see if we can figure out what it is and why we might be modifying it to, to that. So it's the MAC address of our floating IP. So what would, re what would be responding to this this ARP request then, because our virtual machine doesn't have that MAC address, it's not going to respond to that, that ARP request. It's not going to say, I am here. So let's take a look at OVN again. So we do OVN NBCTL show. So the MAC address we're looking for is this one, 735B. So where does that appear? So we can see from that output, it actually doesn't appear in OVN. So What's happening with that flow then? Maybe let's, let's keep reading and we might figure it out. So we modify the MAC address, then we do a bunch of other stuff related to ARP, and we assign this packet to some registers. And that's just a way for OVN to keep track of it. And then we resubmit to table 37. So we can dump specific tables by, by doing table equals 37 in our dump flows command. Let's just clear the screen and we'll do that again. So this is a really small table. So what happens when we get here then? So we first come in, we reset this register 14, we assign it some metadata, and then we resubmit to table 38. So let's check table 38. So here in table 38, Let's clear the screen again, actually. So here in table 38, what would happen here? So looking at table 38, it's quite hard to know what's actually happening here, but we can see a number of these rules have quite a number of packets, like this one, for example, and that one would be resubmitting to 39. This one as well, resubmitting to 39. This one, resubmitting to 39. So it looks like our traffic probably goes to table 39, but 
How do we know for sure? Let's try and figure this out. So we do a watch D and run that command again. So now we can see as things change. So let's go back to our director node and let's try an rping 172201620. So that's responding. So this is sending out an ARP packet. We're using ARP because we can't we can't actually ping it. So we're just using ARP. Now let's go back to our compute node and see if any of these rules are incrementing really quickly. So it looks like these two are incrementing. Okay, let's stop the R ping and see if everything is still incrementing there. So then we get to this table 39. Now we can see there's a couple here that are incrementing fairly regularly. If we go back here and start the R ping again. So we're either going to be matching this rule, which I don't think we are because that would be dropping it, or we're going to be matching this one, which sets a bunch of information again and then sends it to table 40. Now obviously this is very cumbersome to do this. This is the point I'm trying to illustrate is there's a lot of these rules and it's going to be very difficult to sit here and manually read through each one. So we have a tool for this and the tool makes it a lot easier. What we what we really want to do is identify why our ICMP traffic isn't working and we want to do it within the context of OVS and OVN. How can we identify where this ping traffic is being dropped? So we've still got, we've still got ping running, right? So we can try just grepping for ICMP and see if anything makes sense for us. So be our int and we'll grep for ICMP. So there's still quite a lot of rules. I guess we can try and filter it out a little bit by removing some of the things we don't care about. So here we have some rules and they're just resubmitting to table 12. So that, that still doesn't really help us. So what we need to do then, and what we can do is use a tool called OVS app CTL OF proto trace, which will trace the packet through these open flow rules. And there's a corresponding tool for OVN called OVN trace that we'll look at as well in a minute. So what we what we want to do is we want to do a TCP dump again. And we just want to count one and we want to output it as hex. So that is the hexadecimal information for that packet. So we'll go back to that blog post that has been handily written up by my friend. So we'll go down to the TCP dump section. Uh, I'm going to leave a link to this so you guys can do, you guys can follow along and, and do all this for yourself as well. But we want to use TCP dump to capture the hexadecimal traffic. Okay, so down in this section, you can see here that we capture some traffic with this command and we output it as hexadecimal and then we pass it to this command called OVS TCP undump. So to get this we need to install the OV, uh, OVS test package. So let's go back to our node. We're going to do dnf search for openv switch. Okay so these are all the openv switch packages this is a test one. We just need to know which version we already have installed. So we can do uh, RPM QA grep open V switch. So we have 2.15 installed. So the one we would need to install is this 2.15 dash test package. So we can see I've already done that there. So the next thing we want to do, we go back to the blog post, is we want to set a variable that is the output of that flow. So we're going to just paste the command straight from the blog post in here. And we're going to look at what we need. So we'll clear the screen so it's a bit easier. So what we need is we need the tap device name. We need what we're capturing. And we need the host. So in my case, I just want to capture on ETH7 as we were doing. And we only want to capture one packet, so that's what this C1 is. And 
source host. So we don't want to do source host. We'll just do host 172.20.16.20, which is our virtual machine. So we'll capture that one packet, and then we will echo dollar flow. So we can see there that what we've done is we've captured that single packet as hexadecimal, and we've used OVS TCP undump to turn that into this big long string that represents that, that single packet. So the next thing we want to do is we want to run OVS appctl of proto trace and we want to pass it in that variable. So again, we're going to need to change some things about this command. So our import will be different in this case. Our import will be if you want to see the ports, you can do OFCTL show BR int. And this will show the ports on that bridge. So in our case, this is going to be coming in on port 30 because that is our patch BR int to BRX. So we're going to do it on port 30. So I'm going to paste in the command again. So we can just delete this and do import 30. So what happens when we run that? Now what we can see here is this gives us a whole bunch more useful information. We'll go up to the top. So we run that command. And what it's done is it's unpacked that flow and it's determined that it's ICMP traffic. It's coming from a destination source MAC address of this, and it's going to this MAC address. It's coming from a network source of 192.168.185. So we go here and do IPOA. We can see my, my IP address in this case is indeed what it said it is. I also have this IP address, but just ignore that. It's going to this IP address. It has TTL of 63, now by default 64, so why 63? Because we've hopped through my router to get there, so we've had to decrement the TTL by one. It's ICMP type 8, which is an echo request. Now this next section shows us what flow rules that matches on. So instead of us reading through those flow rules to figure it all out, this tells us which flow rules it matches on. So it comes in on import 30 in table zero with all this information and it gets resubmitted to table 8. Table 8 resubmits to 9, 10, etc, 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 all the way down until we get to table 30. Table 30 says that anything with the destination MAC address of this needs to go to 37. 37, we keep following the bouncing ball all the way through all the tables, we end up on 65. We can see we clone it and we are resubmitting to a table 8. So we resubmit to table 8, 9, we follow the bouncing ball again. We come down to this table 19, IP metadata. Anything with a network destination of 192.168.50.024. Decrement the TTL. Okay, so if we're decrementing a TTL, we know we're routing at this point. We change the destination IP address. We set the field to be the source MAC address now. So now instead of the source MAC address being the one from my router, we're changing that source MAC address to be the one from our Neutron router. And we can see that back here, if we do OVN and VCTL show grep, so we can see that's the MAC address of our internal network on the router. So we've, we've changed the MAC address now for the flow. We assign some information to just a, a register within Open vSwitch and then we resubmit to 20. So again, we're following the bouncing ball. We are setting it here in table 23. We're setting the fields. So this is, will be the MAC address of the virtual machine. That's going to be our ethernet destination now. So we do IPA for that MAC address, so it is indeed. 
A2, A2. We can see that's the MAC address of our virtual machine now. So, so far we're working. Like So far this looks great. We are sending this traffic. We're doing all the right things. So we haven't found where it's being blocked just yet. Keep scrolling down. We follow the bouncing ball again. So we're setting field any to the import that we come from. Then we are sending it to 65. And here on 65, we set a whole bunch of fields and then resubmit to 8, 9, blah, blah, blah. So we're, we're looping over, but now we've we've changed all the information about this packet, right? We've changed the MAC address. So now we're starting again. We're going back through all the registers and seeing if we find a match. We come down here. So then what we see down here is that the final flow ends up being, we set the ethernet source to our router. We set the des destination to our virtual machine. We set the destination to our virtual machine's IPv4 address and we now have a TTL of 62. So the next thing that happens is we need to contract that. So contract is how we keep track of packets and we know where to send that packet back to. So it gets added to the contract table. So the network source, so this is all the information that's being added to contract so it knows that it needs to send that packet back to me. So once we've gone through the contract workflow, then we come down to BRint. The contract state now is new, established, or track, so anything that matches on those. We're going to set some fields, resubmit to 44, and then in table 44, we're dropping that packet. So we know that it gets dropped now in table 44. If we do OVS VSCTL, dump OVS OFCTL, sorry, dump flows br int table equals 44 so here in this table 44 we can see something interesting if we grep for 22 actually we'll grep for tp dst equals 22 so if our destination port is port 22 then we resubmit to 45 but if it's not if it's anything else, we don't seem to have a match for it. So what this tells us then is that there is a drop configured. Like this packet is being deliberately and intentionally dropped. So it's something about our configuration. And we know, like we know because we just did it, that it's a security group configuration. But there's something about our configuration that has dropped this packet. We know that everything happened correctly up until this point that packet was coming into the compute node and everything is in place from a networking perspective for that packet to reach the vm but there's just something wrong with our configuration so this is the point where we know we can go back and start checking our security groups to say hey is icmp traffic allowed to this this virtual machine so what we're going to do is we're going to allow icmp traffic now and we're going to see how that changes so we'll go create protocol will be ICMP and we'll add it to the security group called block ICMP. So this should now allow traffic. I'm not going to rename it, but for the purpose of this video, we know that, that this will now allow this ping. So we'll go back here and we'll start the ping again. So now it works. So let's run exactly the same trace again with exactly the same packet and see what happens. So now, here's where we got to before, but now when we get to table 44, we find that we're getting resubmitted to 45. So let's have a look at table 44 and we'll grep for ICMP. So now we have some more information here. We'll get rid of that. ICMP6, we're not using IPv6. There's now these extra two flow rules that have been added into OpenFlow. And it's handling this specific packet, right? So we're handling ICMP. We're handling... We're handling this specific case of where ICMP traffic is coming into these OpenFlow rules and we're resubmitting it to table 45 and that's what we see in this flow output now is 45 then we follow we keep going we can see that it gets 
it gets contract again, blah, 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 resubmit. But now it's actually working. We're not reaching a point where we're dropping that packet. So we knew from the um, OF proto trace that we were blocking it somewhere within our configuration within Neutron. It was, it was configured to do so. So just to overview that section before we move into doing the same in OVM, what we did was we we knew that the traffic ICMP traffic to the virtual machine would be blocked. We started pinging and we could see that the traffic was reaching the compute node because everything was in place for ARP to respond. Like my system knew where to find that IP address, my router knew where to send that traffic, it sent it to the compute node. We TCP dumped on the interface in BRX, which is where the, the network traffic would come in. That's where the physical port is plugged into my server. We knew it made it that far, we just couldn't see that ICMP reply happening. So then we TCP dumped within the virtual machine and we couldn't see the ICMP traffic. So we knew at that point there's something between the physical port on my server within Open vSwitch stopping that traffic from getting to that virtual machine. So we did a TCP dump and we captured that one specific packet that was failing, which is the ICMP echo request from my laptop to the virtual machine. And we fed that into OVS app CTL, OF proto trace. And what we saw was that there was a flow rule configured to drop that traffic explicitly. So because we knew that there was a rule dropping it, that probably means that there's something configured in our security groups to drop it. So what we did was we went back to our security groups and we added in a rule that would allow the protocol ICMP. And at that point we saw we got two extra flow rules created in OpenFlow to handle the ICMP traffic. And at that point, the traffic was able to reach the VM and the VM was able to respond.